California school teacher, the mother of six children, was kidnapped some time ago by five drug addicts. She was stabbed 20 times in the back. Her captors told the police that they were warlocks, that is, male witches, and that they were devil worshippers. In Montana, some time ago, a 22-year-old social worker picked up a hitchhiker near Yellowstone National Park, and the hitchhiker then shoots his victim in the head, brutally attacks the dead body, and tells the police that he worships the devil. In Miami Beach, a 69-year-old retired woman is viciously attacked by a young woman who later tells reporters very happily that for the last five years, she has been worshiping Satan, and this is her sacrifice to the devil. Story after story after story like that could be told tonight if we only had time to tell it. The scripture has a great deal to say about the devil and demons. In fact, the whole Bible is the story of a conflict between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. And the scripture I would like for you to turn to is Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, two verses, the 10th and 11th verses of Deuteronomy. There shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or who useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of mediums, or a wizard. You remember the story of Saul? He broke that law of God. He had lost contact with God. God had left him. No more blessing upon Saul, the great king of Israel. And so he decided that he was going to consult a medium and try to get a message from Samuel. He consulted the medium. He was successful in talking briefly with Samuel, but he was killed shortly thereafter as the judgment of God fell upon Saul and his family. Now, Americans at this hour are vacillating, according to the latest polls. Some deny the existence of the devil altogether, but others have an unnatural fascination with the devil and with demons and with exorcism and other things in the occult. And because of the success of the exorcist and many new films are being made on the subject of the devil and evil right now, a pastor who saw one of these films said recently, it was obnoxious, repulsive, disgusting, pornographic, and obscene. I myself have not seen any of these films. I do not intend to expose myself to this type of thing. But a Jesuit priest who saw one... But a Jesuit priest who saw one of these films said in his survey among university students, most students that have seen the films wish they'd never seen them. Now, this is not a phenomenon just in America. It's also in Germany, where there are thousands of witches. It's also in Great Britain. A British bishop said the other day that Great Britain is turning to black magic as their interest in Christianity declines. And I believe that one of the problems in the world today that is not recognized is the great intensification and acceleration of evil in the world at this moment because the devil knows his time is short. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ may be drawing near. And the scripture teaches that as the coming of the Lord draws near, the activity of the devil will intensify. The kidnapping, the violence, the terror all over the world, I believe, is a part of demonic activity. One authority says that witchcraft is growing faster than any other religion in the Western world. And one reason I think that young people get involved is because it does get them involved. It's a return to nature, in a sense, a worship of the natural gods, finding some power within themselves are broadening their minds, some of them through drugs and some without drugs. But thousands of young and old alike are dabbling 
in the occult at this moment. Shops in our cities are selling all types of things that go along with the occult. One university professor, not this university, but a university professor said some time ago that there were dozens of covens on their campus. Now, a coven, as you know, is a circle of witches and warlocks, and warlocks are male witches, numbering 13. They're always number 13. And they have their rites and their rituals and their literature and their witchcraft. Now, what is right and what is wrong? What is false and what is true? The Bible has a lot to say about it, and I'm going to cover a big subject in a very few minutes tonight. First, the Bible teaches there is a devil. There is a devil. We meet him in the third chapter of Genesis, and we don't get rid of him till the end of the book of Revelation. He's all the way through the Bible. And in the Bible, we find that he's a person. He walks, he talks, he tempts, he lies, he flatters, he kills, he works miracles, he counterfeits, he oppresses, he afflicts, he influences, he destroys, he quotes and misquotes scripture, he possesses, he inflicts bodily injury, he sows discord in the church, he spreads false doctrine. Those are the things that this personality in the Bible called the devil does according to the scripture. Now he's called in the Bible, he's called Satan. He's called the devil. He's called a fallen angel. He's called a roaring lion. He's called the prince of demons. He's called a wolf, a prowler, Beelzebub, the dragon, the serpent, Lucifer, a great light, a star, a betrayer, an adversary, a wonder worker, a liar, the father of lies, the god of this world, the prince of this world, and the prince of it and power of the air. His is described in the Bible as the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of unrighteousness, the kingdom of hatred, sin, death, hell, and the grave. He produces false miracles, false spiritual experiences, false tongues, the father of fakery. He has a false church, a false gospel, a false plan of salvation, a false trinity, false preachers, false prophets. That's what the Bible says about the devil. Now the word Lucifer means light bearer. One who shines. It's a deceptive light. It's not the true light. It's a deceptive light. It's a false light. He promises freedom, liberty, and life. But he produces only sorrow, slavery, and death. He's a deceiver. And he's trying to deceive thousands of you young people tonight. By promising you that if you only follow him and serve him and bow down to him and live for him, that he will give you freedom, liberty, and life. But actually, he gives you sorrow, slavery, and ultimately eternal death and hell. Now, the devil is resisted in the Bible by the characters of the Bible that God honored and blessed and loved. He was resisted by Job. He was resisted by Jesus. He was resisted by the disciples. He was cast out of heaven. And the Bible says he will eventually and ultimately be cast into hell, the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now you say, how did the devil originate? Why, why did God allow the devil? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. The Apostle Paul calls evil the mystery of iniquity. There are just some things we don't know. God did not reveal it to us. And if God did not reveal it to us, we shouldn't be delving into speculation. But there are some hints in the Bible about where the devil originated. In Isaiah, the 14th chapter, and Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. In the 14th of Isaiah, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
how art thou cast down to the ground? For thou hast said in thy heart, and then it says five times, I will, putting his will against God's will. Listen to it. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In other words, there came a time somewhere back in eternity when Lucifer, the highest and greatest of all of God's created beings, led a rebellion against God. And it seems that about a third of the angels joined him in the rebellion. They were cast out of heaven. They landed on this earth. And the devil and these fallen angels who have now become demons are active on this planet. They're under judgment. They've been defeated by the cross and the resurrection. They are ultimately going to be cast into hell. But in the meantime, they are active and increasing their activity. Now, the sin of Lucifer was pride. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be above God. He wanted to be the greatest being in all the universe. So he led the rebellion. You say, where did he get this idea? We don't know. How did sin enter his heart? We don't know. Why did God allow him? We don't know. This is wrapped up in the mystery of God. It's wrapped up in the mystery of iniquity. It's something we don't understand. And it'll never be resolved until the battle of Armageddon, when our Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back, followed by thousands of the armies of heaven, and he's going to destroy forever the devil and his angels. And we'll be rid on this planet of the greatest plague and the greatest thing that has ever happened to any planet anywhere in the universe. Now the second thing, what about demons? The New Testament makes one thing clear. There's one devil, there are many demons. You remember the story in the fifth chapter of Mark, the man of the Gadarenes? This man was possessed of a devil, many demons. And it had affected his mental, his emotional, and his physical faculties. And, he, and Jesus held conversation, not with the man, but with the demons. Jesus never talked to the man at all. He talked to the demons. And there are several things about that man that interest me today and are relevant at this hour in America. He was naked. He was a streaker. He was violent. He was violent. And look at the violence in the country. And he wanted, he wanted the demons to be cast, or the demons wanted to be cast into the swine, into the pigs. You see the combination you have here? You have violence, nakedness, self-destruction, and pigs. What do some of the people call the police today? Some of the more violent people. Pigs. Is there a connection? I don't know, but it's quite interesting that this demon-possessed man that Jesus encountered would have all of those things that we're wrestling with today. Now, the origin of demons, as I said a moment ago, is unclear. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, the devil and his angels fight against Michael, the archangel, and his angels. Now you say, what about exorcism? Well, do you know what the word exorcism actually means? The word exorcism means expelling spirits by a religious act or a religious service. That's how what it means, expelling an evil spirit. And Jesus, of course, was the greatest of all exorcists. He commanded the demons and the forces of evil to come out of people. And that man 
that I was telling about a moment ago. He commanded this legion of demons to leave and they left and went into the swine and the swine went hurtling into the sea and destroyed themselves. Now the fact of exorcism is a reality, but it's misunderstood. Some of the modern interpretations originated actually in pagan practices. Magic formulas and rituals to expel evil spirits have been practiced for centuries in primitive societies, usually accompanied by violence and infliction of pain. There's one tribe in India that I read about where they take a cotton wick soaked in oil and they light it and they stuff it up the nostrils of the person who is supposed to be possessed of demons. And the cruelty of professional exorcists in many parts of the world is beyond our comprehension and understanding. Now, Matthew, the eighth chapter, tells us that when the disciples brought to Jesus many that were demon possessed, he cast out the spirits, not with a long ritual, as we're being told today, but by a word, his word. And his disciples cast out demons. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By a word. The power of the name of Christ. And Mark 16, 17 says, And these signs shall accompany those who have believed in my name. They shall cast out demons. However, there's a warning. Don't go around using some sort of hocus pocus and say, be gone in the name of Jesus. It won't work. You have got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you have to be walking in the Spirit and you have to know that that's a demon and you have to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have the authority of God's Word back of you. Behind the name of Jesus stands the power of Almighty God. Now, how do you keep from being possessed or harassed and vexed by demons? You see, demons have power only, that is, as far as a Christian is concerned, only when you are walking in some sin. If you allow a besetting, besetting sin to get a grip on you, you've opened the way for the demons in your life. As we walk with Christ, if you're a Christian and you're walking in the Spirit and God is with you and all known sin has been confessed and you're in fellowship with Christ, then you can walk in the middle of the most dangerous spiritual situations and be protected by God. You can claim authority over the devil and his angels. But I'll tell you what the devil will do. He'll bluff as far as he can. He'll take all the ground that you give him. Give him an inch, he'll take a foot. A woman possessed of the spirit of divination, you remember, bothered Paul in Philippi. And he said, you evil spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of this woman and leave her alone. And the evil spirit came out. Now, I personally have had that experience a few times, but very few. And I was trying to think only once in America. I remember twice in India. I remember once in Africa and once in the Far East, twice in the Far East. And on each occasion, very interestingly, the person involved used the same three words. I am free. Christ can free you. But it's not done with a ritual. It's not done with the way we're, it's being depicted. It's done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every believer, every Christian, has the right to pray that prayer with a person who is in trouble. Now, a great many things that we call demon possession are not demon possession at all. For example, mental problems are not caused by demons. Some may be, but many are not. And so you have to have discernment that only the Holy Spirit can give you as to what is demon activity and what is normal activity or the activity of nature. 
You say, well, how do we overcome demons when they bother us and harass us? I want you to listen to this. First of all, be sure you know Christ. I do not believe that a true believer in Jesus Christ can be possessed by a demon. You can be vexed by a demon. You can be harassed by a demon. But I do not believe the scripture teaches you can be possessed by a demon. Now, Satan filled Judas. Satan filled Ananias and Sapphira who were professing believers. We're told in scripture. But are you sure that you know Christ? Do you know that Jesus Christ lives in your heart? Have you settled it? Come to Christ tonight while you can. As Bill Cepeda said he did five years ago. As Mike said he did three years ago. Come to Christ. Surrender your life to him and make sure about that. And you will have a power living in you that is greater than he that is in the world. You will have the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God in your life. And you can resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. The second thing, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you tonight as a believer, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? You can be filled not through some emotional ecstasy. You can be filled by a simple act of faith. How did you receive Christ? You received him simply by faith. All right, you're filled the same way. You can say, I am filled by the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit by faith. You see, the moment you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart. And as you surrender everything that he points out that's wrong in your life, then he fills you and you're filled and you produce fruit. Now, every Christian has the gifts of the Spirit. You have a gift. I don't care who you are and how lowly a Christian you are, you have a gift. And you ought to be utilizing that gift in the body of Christ, and you ought to be utilizing that gift in witnessing for Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is something different. The fruit of the Spirit is different than the gifts of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is produced by the Holy Spirit, love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and so forth. That's produced by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are living in the Spirit, producing the fruit of the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, Satan cannot get inside of you at all. But let me tell you, sin, even the slightest little sin, will grieve the Holy Spirit and open the way for demonic activity. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor desert you. I will not forsake you. Now, the third thing, watch for the schemes of the devil. The scripture says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, the devil is going to exploit your personality quirks, the lust of the flesh, the natural physical drives that you have, hunger, as he did Jesus. He tempted Jesus when Jesus was hungry. The devil always comes to you when you're weak to tempt you, to harass you, to trouble you. Watch out for those moments when you're weak, when you're hungry. He also uses the sex drive. Sex is a powerful drive that we all have, and the devil will use it if we give him a half an inch. For our struggle, the scripture says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual for forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And the scripture says, therefore, take up the full armor of God, that ye may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And then the Bible outlines the armor that we should have. And I want to ask you tonight if you have your armor on. Have you checked it? First, check it. The belt. Paul said, having your loins girt with truth. Now, 
the belt or the, gir or the girdle was a belt about six or seven inches wide that went around a Roman soldier. And by the way, when Paul was writing this in Ephesians, he was in a Roman jail and a Roman guard was guarding him, so he just looked at his uniform and got his illustrations for how we Christians ought to be. And one was that belt, because you see, that belt or that girdle held everything else in place. And Paul says, have your loins girt with truth. In other words, learn the scriptures, learn the word of God. That's the reason when people come forward to receive Thief Christ, we give them a Bible study and we get them involved in the scriptures, reading the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures. This is how we resist the devil. When Jesus Christ was tempted of the devil, what did he do? Argue with the devil? No. He resisted the devil by quoting scripture. That's all he did, just quote scripture. He said, it is written. And when he was finished quoting the scripture, the devil would leave him and angels would come and minister to him. And then Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate was made of bronze backed with tough pieces of hide. And the breastplate of righteousness is what we get from Jesus Christ when we come to him as our Lord and Savior. Because our righteousness, our goodness is filthy rags in the sight of God. So you need a righteousness that has been provided for you. And it was provided for you by Jesus Christ on the cross. And we receive the breastplate of righteousness. So that when the devil shoots his fiery darts, they can't penetrate that breastplate. And then thirdly, he says, how about your boots? having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, that doesn't mean to go out and just preach the gospel. It means more than that. It means that you should have the peace of God in your heart. The serenity, the joy, the happiness that Christ gives should be in your heart so that when troubles come, Satan will not be able to get close to you. You see, Satan uses worry, anxiety, and tension to keep us off balance. Are you afraid? Do not fear, for I am with you, says God. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will uphold you with my right hand, says God in Isaiah 41. Are you worried about inflation? Everybody is. Bills are stacking up. Pressures of business closing in. Children getting out of hand. Are those are the things you're worried about? The scripture says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all comprehension will guard, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then fourthly, what about the shield? The Roman soldiers carried a shield. The scripture says, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Now, Roman's shield was two feet wide and four feet long, and it warded off the blows of the enemy. He would hide behind it when, Rome, when arrows would come against him. Satan is always shooting his missiles and his darts at us. We need the shield of faith. Trusting, believing in God, taking God at his word. And then fifthly, there's the helmet. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet is very important because it guards the brain, protected the head. There's a lot in the scripture to say about the mind. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Intellectually, you cannot come to Christ alone. Because your mind has a veil over it put there by the devil. But when you come to Christ, your mind is illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And the things that you didn't understand before, you now accept by faith. And you put on the helmet. And that helmet protects you against the enemy. The devil is going to try to cause you to doubt. He's going to try to cause you to question. I remember my own father. He had been told by a preacher many years ago that he'd committed the unpardonable sin and my father thought all those years that he couldn't come to Christ. He hadn't committed it. He didn't even know what it was. 
And it was years later that he found the joy of his salvation again. You see, Satan had sidetracked and perverted the scriptures. And then there's the sword and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's the offensive weapon. You see, our Roman's blade was about 24 inches long and he would twist and turn, keep his balance always thrusting. And the scripture says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the sword, the word of God. That's the reason it's important to study the Bible, to know the Bible, to learn the Bible. And I believe this. I believe that Christians and believers are going to go through a period of trouble and difficulty. We may go to jail. We may be killed for our faith, as many people in other parts of the world have been. We're not going to escape. It's on the way. And the way to get prepared is to learn this book so that when they do call upon you to witness, when they do call upon you, you know the scriptures and you can quote the word of God and be a witness and resist the devil. And the scripture says he will flee. And then the seventh and the last thing is to pray. Pray without ceasing, said Paul. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. Praying and Bible study. Check your armor. Is it in place? One final word. The final victory. The devil and his works and death and hell and the grave have been nullified. They've been destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. The victory is won. The victory is assured. Till that final day, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of fighting, a lot of battling, but we're on the winning side. And the scripture teaches that Jesus Christ has won the victory. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. There is power in the blood. Tonight I want to speak on the subject of peace. And I want to speak on the subject of peace, not only in the world, but in your life, in your family, your community, your neighborhood, in your place of work. In the book of James, the fourth chapter, we take our text, James 1, 4, 1 and 2. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust and war in your members? Ye lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Where do these wars come from? People are asking that constantly. And what can we do about it? Because it seems that tonight the world is on the very edge of another precipice that could take us even to Armageddon itself. There's a climate of fear. A world seems to be almost out of control. In some countries, they're fa facing economic ruin. In some parts of the world, they're fighting political and social forces which seem to be pushing the world relentlessly to the brink of chaos. Am I a pessimist or an optimist? Which are you? I was walking in the dining room in Washington some time ago and there were two senators sitting there at the Senate dining room and they were having a discussion and one of them called over and said, Billy, which are you, an optimist or a pessimist? I said, I'm an optimist. And they said, why? I said, because I've read the last chapter of the Bible and I believe that God is in control of our world. I heard about two convicts looking out of a cell window one night. The pessimists saw the bars. The optimists saw the stars. But terrorism and war have become one of the sober realities of our world. An American television network recently did a long study on the Middle East on television at prime time, and they entitled it, 
near Armageddon. Yet, we're thankful that we're not yet at Armageddon. Someone has said, peace is that brief, glorious moment in history when everybody stands around reloading. Why can't people live in peace? What causes wars? Jesus said, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness and jealousies and all the rest. The things that cause war come out of our hearts. You don't have to read the newspaper to read about wars or to see wars. There are fights in the school playground, quarrels in your family, most murders in the area that I come from are committed within families. Even a tug of war in your own heart. And it would be wrong to concentrate on nuclear disarmament alone if we don't see other wars among men. Racial wars, class wars, bitterness in politics, cutthroat business practices, all kinds of things. Now there are three kinds of peace spoken of in the Bible. First, there is peace with God. That's in the spiritual order. Peace with God. There's a more fundamental war going on in the world. It's the war against God. You say, well, I'm not against God, but God sees it as a war. We break his laws. We disregard all of his plans. And he sees us at war with him. And it started in the very beginning. When God created man, he created him perfect. He never meant that man would fight, that there'd be jealousy and hatred or lust or greed or hunger, starvation or racism. He never meant that there would even be death. Man was to live forever in a paradise. But when God created man, he gave him a gift of freedom of choice. He didn't create you a robot. He could push a button and you would obey. You're not a computer. You're not a calculator that God pushes buttons and you obey. You make your own decisions. You make up your own mind. You have a will of your own. That's the way God made you. He made you in his image, not the physical image, but the moral image. And you have a right to choose the kind of life you want to live and the kind of destiny you want to have and where you want to spend eternity. Because whether you like it or not, you are going to live forever. The real you, the part of you that lives inside of your body that we call soul or spirit, lives forever, either in heaven or hell. And you make the choice. God offers you his love and his mercy and his grace and he gave his son to die on the cross for you. But if you reject it, we make our own hell in this life and the life to come. So there must be peace made with God. Now, peace with God is simply bringing things back into order through the intervention of God by his son through his spirit. In Colossians 1, it says, and having made peace through the blood of the cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. When Christ died on the cross and shed his blood, that made it possible for us to be reconciled with God. And that's what this mission is all about. To get people to realize that they can be reconciled to God and have peace in their own hearts, peace in their family, peace in the neighborhood, and ultimately peace in the world. Because Ephesians 2.14 says, He is our peace who has made both one and broken down the wall of partition that divides us. Christ is our peace. If you want peace, come to Christ. If you want true peace, come to Christ. If you want to make a contribution to world peace, give your life to Christ. And that's the greatest contribution you can make. He is the only basis for making peace between God and man, the Bible teaches. Then secondly, there's the psychological order or peace of God. St. Augustine many years ago described it as the tranquility of order. 
In the Old Testament, there was a young man that God called by the name of Gideon, and he had a big army to go out and fight another big army, and God said, your army is too big, Gideon, you'll lose. And he finally cut it down to 300 men to go fight a major army. And he was very frightened. And God said, Gideon, relax. I'm with you. And Gideon built an altar and called it Jehovah Shalom. God is peace. Why? Because God was putting the whole thing together for Gideon. And God can put your life together for you. Your marriage, your relationships with friends or neighbors or fellow workers. Now, God does not remove the troubles and the difficulties in life. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. It was some physical disability that he had. And three times he asked God to remove it. But God said, no, my grace will be sufficient. I'll be with you in the midst of your suffering. I'll be with you. And then we have a catalog of all the sufferings that Paul went through. God did not remove the harsh realities of life, but he gave him the grace and the strength and the power to go through them victoriously so that when he was in prison, he could sing and testify. And right at the very last, before he was slain in Rome, he could shout triumphantly, that he was ready to meet God. Jehovah Shalom says, if you put your life in my hands, I'll order it. I'll get it together the way I want it together. And if you will let me work things out, you'll have peace and you'll have a new life. Now as Christians, Jesus said, I'm going to send you out as sheep among wolves. Can you think of anything more dangerous than that? Behold, I send you as sheep among wolves. But he adds something else. While in the midst of the wolves, Christ himself will give you peace and he will be with you to help you. Now that is the Christian distinctive. That is what helps make us different than other people in the world. Christ is with us in the midst of our troubles and our difficulties and our hardships. We are not exempted from all the difficulties that other people have to go through. I'm sometimes alarmed about a certain trend in certain aspects of the church, especially in America, which suggests that God will make you always happy and healthy and wealthy if you come to Christ. That is not true. When you come to Christ, many times the difficulties increase. I'll tell you why. He says there are two roads in life. One is a broad road and one's a narrow road. And you make a choice. And when you decide to receive Christ and go through a narrow gate and go on the narrow road that leads to eternal life, you go in the middle of the broad road and you're going against the stream of humanity. And that brings friction and sometimes more difficulty than you ever had before. But God will be with you in the middle of it. The Bible teaches that we're going to confront harsh realities. Jesus said, count the cost. He said, if you're not willing to deny self, your own selfish ambitions and your selfish sensual pleasures and deny yourself the wrong things and take up the cross, what does that mean? Jesus said, I'm going to die. Will you go and die with me? It's going to be very unpopular to hang on that cross. Will you go back to your school and back to your work and back to your neighborhood and take your stand for me? even though they laugh at you and make fun of you and say things about you. That's what it costs to follow Christ in our present age. The Bible teaches that we're going to have to face that. And man by himself is limited. How are we going to handle it? Well, some of you will say, well, it won't happen to me, but it will sooner or later. 
because there comes a time when we all suffer. A problem can start like that. And sooner or later, we all die. Sometimes, somewhere, there'll be that stroke or that heart attack or that knowledge that you have cancer eating at you. Or a motor car wreck that can happen so fast that you cannot bat an eye. And we're all involved in all of this. But in the midst of whatever it is, Christ is with you if you know him. Because you see, there's the peace of God. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give it give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. No matter what you're facing, don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. I'll give you my peace. But in the midst of the storms of life, which are always going to rage, there's the peace of God if you have peace with God. That's yours. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, this psychological peace does not come from evading or avoiding or manipulating. It comes supernaturally from God. Now, there's a third kind of peace. Relational peace. Peace on earth. When the angels came and announced the birth of Jesus Christ, they said, peace on earth, goodwill among men. Where did that go? Why haven't we had peace? Didn't Jesus come to bring peace, you say? And all these wars in these 2,000 years? Yes, but people misunderstood. They would have had peace had they received him and believed on him and followed him. But they rejected him. And we have rejected it. We didn't talk about the Prince of Peace when the United Nations was founded. He was left out. We'll never have peace in this world until we take into account the Prince of Peace and make him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Bible says there's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And that day is coming. Yes, there's going to be a judgment for you and for me. You're going to someday stand before Almighty God. Every person here today and all of you that are watching by television, you will stand alone before God. Every thought that you've ever thought, every intent of your heart, every moral choice that you ever made that was wrong, Every sin that you ever committed is going to be brought to light. The tapes are rolling. The film is rolling. It's all there. And you'll have to face it and give an account. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. The scripture says God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man Christ Jesus. Are you ready for the judgment day? You can be, because you see, in spite of the fact that God is a God of judgment, he's even more a God of love. He loves you. He offers his mercy to you. He offers forgiveness to you. If you come to the cross where Christ took your sins, you see, when Christ died on the cross, God put upon him your sins and mine. He became sin for us. He became guilty of our sins. He suffered the judgment for us. He took the hell for us. There is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, I'm going to tell you something. If you're in Christ, you'll never be at that great white throne judgment. It's past for you. It's finished. When Jesus bowed his head and said on the cross, it is finished, the way to heaven was finished. The way of salvation was completed. Not by my goodness, not because I go to church, or because I read the Bible, or because I'm a clergyman. He did it on the cross. 
And there are hundreds of you here tonight and hundreds of you watching that have been baptized and confirmed as I was. But when I reached about 16 or 17, I realized something was wrong. Something was missing. I really didn't know Christ for myself. Something was missing. What is it? It's that personal relationship with Christ in which you have repented of your sins and received him by faith and he lives now in your heart. But there's coming a day. Jesus said, thy kingdom will come. His prayer is going to be answered. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's never been answered. But it's going to be answered. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many peoples and they shall beat their swords into pruning hooks and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In the meantime, God expects us to work for peace. We're to do all we can to bring peace because we do not know whether this is the end time or not. We do not know when the kingdom is going to come and take over the world. But the peace can begin in your life right now. You say, what do I have to do? First, you must repent of your sin. What does that mean? That means that you're willing to say to God, I have sinned and I'm sorry for it. I'm willing to change my way of living. The second thing, receive by faith Jesus Christ into your heart and make him Lord of your life. And